When, uh, when we lived in Portland, I loved having a bigger airport near us because there's a lot more options for airlines to fly on. And one of my favorites became Southwest Airlines uh, because for me, I'm all about the price of the airline ticket. And so Southwest was usually ch cheaper than most of the other airlines. And so that was typically where we would fly. But, but there was something about Southwest that I couldn't stand is Southwest, on most major airlines, right, you get to select your seat. You want either the aisle seat or the window seat, right? Not many people choose to select the middle seat. Well, when you're flying Southwest, you don't get the option of choosing your seat. You're, it's all based on your boarding uh, order. And so if you're in bo boarding group D, that's typically the last one for them. If you're in boarding group D, you are stuck sitting in the middle. And so I remember a few times flying Southwest that I was like the mid to end of the C group and I was just praying that there was an aisle seat or, or a window seat available because I can't stand the middle seat on an airplane. I don't know if you're like me or, or not, but the middle seat on an airplane is awful. It is terrible because the middle seat on an airplane, you feel trapped, right? You feel like you got no space there. You feel like you, you can't bother anybody. You can't make them get up so you're stuck. Even if you got to go to the bathroom, you just try and hold it because you don't want to be a nuisance. And so you've got all these issues, right, sitting there in the middle. And then you've got to fight for the armrest. Right? The middle seat, for whatever reason, the people in the, the aisle seat or the window seat think they own both armrests. And so there you are. If you're like me, you're a bigger person, and you're just stuck like this trying to not bother anybody there in the middle seat. I hate the middle seat on an airplane. It was terrible any time that, that I did that because when you're in the middle seat, you don't have enough room, right? It impacts your ability to, to think clearly. It impacts your ability to rest. If you're like me, you like to work on the airplane, and so it, it impacts your ability to, to do work on the airplane. Why? Because I don't have enough space. When you're in the middle seat, you just simply don't have enough space. You see, space, it, it gives us mental freedom. It gives us mental freedom to be thoughtful in how we live our lives. We make good choices when we have space in our lives. It's the opposite of the pressure that we have in our lives. And so today we're starting a brand new series called Make Space. It's a series about making space in our finances so that they don't restrict our ability to live the lives that God wants us and is calling us to live. And so to do that, we need to make space in our minds and in our hearts to understand the relationship between our possessions and money and, and how they can affect our ability to be good stewards of God's gifts. And so that's why the message today is entitled, The Space Between Your Ears. The space between your ears. Because if we're honest, there's a lot of times where, where we feel in the middle seat of an airplane in terms of our financial management. Because the truth is there is no pressure like financial pressure. There is no pressure like financial pressure. At the end of last year, there was a study that was done recently studying four different, four, it was a survey, excuse me, of 4,000 people. And in this survey that was done at the end of last year, they found that 64% of U.S. consumers are living paycheck to paycheck. That was a rise from the year prior where it was 61% of U.S. consumers were living paycheck to paycheck. And, and what was interesting about this survey is they also surveyed uh, people that made more than $100,000 a year. And, and in that survey, it showed that people who made on annually uh, over $100,000 a year, they were uh, also more likely to, to skip the guacamole on their burritos because everything is seemingly going up in, in price right now. It's, it's affecting everything in the way that, that we live our lives. And so those extra trips to the grocery store, right, the, the unexpected medical expenses, that extra trip we decided to take, it is all beginning to add up. And according to some other data that was released last month by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, it showed that people in the U.S. have more credit card debt than ever before since they started tracking it back in 1999. Can you guess the amount of money the U.S. has in credit card debt? $986 billion. 
$986 billion of credit card debt. And that's higher than in 2019. That was the previous high. In 2019, it was $927 billion of credit card debt. In just three and a half years, it's gone up nearly $60 billion in credit card debt. And that's not to mention that credit card companies have increased their rates on that debt from, it used to be 17.8%. Uh, now it's about, on average, 20.34% in the credit card companies. There's a survey published last week that showed 39% of the U.S. people said in the last year their savings account has shrunk. And in that same survey, 36% of the people said they had more credit card debt than they did in their emergency fund. There is no pressure like financial pressure. We feel trapped. We feel like we can't ask anyone for help. We feel like we can't ask anybody to move for us or, or people to, to get out of the way. We don't have enough room. And it impacts our ability to rest. It impacts our ability to work. It impacts our ability to, to think clearly. And most of us have money habits that came from a lifetime of good and bad money decisions. Even if we've had really great money decisions along the way, there's still a lot of space for us to learn how to balance our spiritual health with the pressures of the world that we live in. And luckily for us, we have the Bible to turn to. If you want to have more financial space, if you want to clear some of the space between your ears, you have to understand that everything belongs to God. In order to make more space between your ears, you have to understand it is foundational to understand that everything belongs to God. This morning, we're going to look at one of the parables that many people who are church, have a church background are familiar with. But this story that we're going to look at today, it, it, illustrates, it illustrates something different. It illustrates not only the benefits of being a good steward, but it also helps us to explain why financial management can be so challenging. As we walk through this parable, we're going to see a, a lot of big keys to understanding our money story and facing our financial fears. And so Matthew chapter 25 is where we're going to look at this parable today. And, and stay with me, we're going to read the entire passage. And so uh, in Matthew 25 verse 14 is where this parable was found. And it says this, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Now, I, I just want you to, again to understand some context real quick before we continue. A bag of silver, the uh, other translations are translated out as a talent. That talent, if you were to look at the financial measurements back in, in the ancient Bible times, a talent was equal to over a year's worth of wages. So one talent was equal to a year's worth of wages or over that. And so the sums of money that these servants were given was incredible amounts of money all right so there was lots of money that this master was handing over to his servants to to take care of and to be resourceful with and so he divided it in proportion continuing in verse 15 to their abilities he then left on his trip the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more the servant with two bags of silver went to work and earned two more but the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid, in the, I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I invested crops I did, and it 
invested, harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from now, but from those who do nothing, even with what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant out into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The master had entrusted his servants with a, a substantial amount of money. He, he had given them his resources. To be entrusted with something, it means that someone trusts you with something. When you are entrusted with something, it means that someone trusts you with something. In our case, God sees us as being worthy of his trust. And he's entrusted us with our skills, talents, and our possessions here on this earth. And when we understand that, that everything belongs to God, that changes how we view our responsibility of our possessions. We begin to see our possessions and see ourselves as not the owner of our possessions, but the renter of our possessions. It's like a, an owner and a renter of a home, right? An owner owns that home property, invests in that property, allows people to come in and use that property. The renter is only there for a short period of time and is just in control of the possessions there. But the landlord who owns the property, they own it before the renter occupies it and they own it after the renter leaves. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 24 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now at this point, you might be sitting there and you might be thinking, man, does God really own the money that I work hard for? I mean, that doesn't seem very fair. I, I work hard for my income. I work hard for the money that I'm earning. But if you really think about it, if you really begin to, to think about it, whatever you do to earn the money, it's also a gift from God, right? The, the skills, the talents, even the opportunities that you were given to earn money, they're only yours because God willed it to happen. He's been your silent partner. He's been that key investor your entire life, whether you knew it or not. He's been investing in you. The fact that everything belongs to God, that should be good news for us. That should be encouraging news because when we let that actually sink in, we understand that we're just here to manage the property. We're just here to manage the property of our lives and not be the owner. And once we understand that, it, it can be a relief. Because if you've ever been a homeowner, you understand all the costs that go into home ownership. Like the faucet leaks and breaks, guess who's got to fix it? Not your landlord. You are the landlord. You've got to pay for it. Get it fixed. If you're a renter and the faucet's leaking, hey, you get to call the landlord. They get to pay to come get it fixed. Very different things of being an owner and being a renter. And yet sometimes we can feel like what God has entrusted us with isn't sufficient. When we're struggling, it's, it's hard to think of the little that we have as a blessing. But there's a passage in Matthew that can encourage you when we have concerns of not having enough. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your, see all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. As we learn to accept this idea that every good thing comes from God, it allows us to make space in our minds, make space in that space between our ears to begin to really live in gratitude for what we have. And we begin to see it as an honor to be trusted with God's resources. It reminds us that our faith and our good management of God's gifts will result in his care for us. It's a, it's a humbling and an empowering thing all wrapped together to acknowledge that we're not the owner of our possessions. We're just managers. And so the first thing we have to understand as we make space between our ears is we have to understand that everything belongs to God. And it's been entrusted to me. 
But the second thing as we look at this parable is that God wants us to be good managers of what he's entrusted us. God wants me to be a good manager. God wants you to be a good manager. Now look at the next part of this parable in Matthew 25, 19. It says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. God wants us to be good stewards of his gifts here on the earth. And the first step we have to do is we got to trust him, right? we got to trust God that he's going to be a good master. And then the next step is to be good stewards of the gifts that he has given to us. And this is something that all of us can continue to, to grow in and learn to get better in. It goes beyond the numbers. It goes beyond being a, a good entrepreneur or somebody who has uh, an unnatural understanding of what hedge, hedge funds are. Uh, becoming a good manager of our finances and being a good steward of God's gifts is something that we need to be diligent about improving every single day. Again, thankfully, God gives us wisdom on how to be good managers. But before we get to that, I want to look at, at the, the servant who had one talent. The servant who had one talent and, and see why there's times in our lives when we fail at being good stewards. Matthew 25, 25 gives the answer. It says, so I was afraid. So I was afraid. Fear of judgment made him hesitant to fail. Fear, fear of failure caused him to, to play it safe. Fear of loss, it made him hesitate to, to risk because when, when you've got one thing, it makes it feel like it's a, a whole lot more to lose. And most of us have, have been there at some point or, or another in our lives. Whether we have a lot or, or a little, we act in fear out of judgment. We act in fear because of fear of failure. We act in fear of loss about making a mistake in our financial choices. The way that we reduce fear is to bring light to them. Remember growing up, we're afraid of the dark. Typically, as children, you're afraid of the dark. I remember the first instance when my kids were afraid of the dark, they had slept in pitch black rooms for quite some time and then something changed in their minds and, and they saw a shadow or something in their room and there was a fear that began to well up inside of them and, and so they called us in because whether it was a, a coat that was hanging or a backpack on the ground or a stuffed animal somewhere, they thought that there was a monster in their room, right? There was this concern, this, this fear that this monster was going to get to them. And so what, as a parent, what do we do to alleviate the fear of the monsters in their rooms? We turn on the light. We turn on the light. We bring their fears into the light so they could see that that thing that they were afraid of, that thing that they were fearful of, it wasn't true. It wasn't a monster. It was an animal. It was a backpack. It was a coat. Today, we're going to have to have the courage to shine a light on our fears. And to do that, we have to be willing to talk about them. We have to be willing to talk about our fears. So let's take a minute and be honest with ourselves for just a moment about where we're at. It's not just about how much money you've got in your bank accounts. It's about how we feel about our financial situation. So just, I'm going to ask you to internally, I'm going to give you five options of, of where you feel like you are in your financial journey right now. Don't share it with anybody. Don't raise your hand. I don't need to know that information. This is for you to contemplate, to bring what fears you might have into the light. So how do you feel about your financial situation? Do you feel like this? I require financial assistance to get by. Or option two, I'm struggling to keep up with my day-to-day -day expenses. Or option three, I'm able to make ends meet. Or option four, I'm able to to make ends meet and have leftover. Or option five, I have more than I need for myself and my family. Where are you at? Just think for a moment. Where are you at in regards to your financial situation? Because acknowledging where we are means that we're able to focus on what we need in our lives right now and where we can have realistic goals so that we can live in gratitude. If we're struggling like that servant who had one talent was, we know that we need to work a little bit harder to trust God in the area of our finances and to not be afraid. Maybe we need to, to lean in to some of our friends or family or even the church to help us 
process the struggle that we're going through. And for those of us and those of you who are lucky to be on the other end of things, you face your own set of challenges. The challenge of how do we keep our possessions from having power over us? We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. But, but here's the thing. Here's what I want you to understand, that knowing where we are is the first step in getting us to where God wants us to be. Knowing where you are is the first step to getting where God wants you to be. So now that we, we've started facing our fears and our finances, what's next? We've got to bring our fears into the light. We have to have the faith to reach for that, that light switch, to, to turn it on. How do we embrace faith over our fear? We remember that everything is a gift from God. Everything is a gift from God, and he continues to provide for us in our daily lives. God has entrusted you with his resources for a reason. God has wisdom, has given you wisdom, and will help you be a great manager. Increasing our financial wisdom is a tool from God. When we think about financial management, it, most of us have learned from two areas in our life. The first is our families. And many of us, it's very early in our, our lives where some of those early financial decisions we make shape how we do finances the rest of our lives. But one of the, er the big areas that impact how we view our finances is the financial industries. Now, there are some great banks out there, some great financial advisors out there and organizations that are dedicated to help people and help families make progress and, and move forward in their lives. But in general, the financial industry is set up to convince you to spend more money, that you have, more money than you have and convince you that you need more stuff. And those practices don't make for living our best lives in Christ. Always wanting more. Despite the fact that each of these servants in our parable, despite the fact that each of them had got different amounts, it was the behavior of acting in faith and being a good manager that the master cared about. Right? Both of the servants were rewarded. Both of the ten and the five, they were rewarded, even though they didn't begin with or end with the same amounts. The two men who put their money to work received the same reward. It, it, it's like this. It was not the portion, but the proportion that made the difference. Let me put it this way for you. It doesn't matter how much you have. What matters is what you do with what you have. It doesn't matter how much you have. It matters what you do with what you have. So how do we apply this biblical principle to our everyday lives? The book of Proverbs is a fantastic book full of a lot of wisdom. And in Proverbs 27, it says this, Riches can disappear fast. So watch your business interests closely. Know the state of your flocks and your herds. You see, back in those days, in, in Bible times, we'll call it, they didn't have bank accounts. They didn't have 401ks. They didn't have investment funds. You knew that you were wealthy by the number of livestock you had. If you had a lot of sheep, a lot of cattle, or a lot of goats, you were considered wealthy. If you didn't have a lot of those things, you were considered to be poor. This passage says, know the state of your flocks. Know the state of your assets. You got to know where your stuff is going, whether it's flocks and herds or checkings and savings accounts. God wants us to pay attention to what he's given to us. He doesn't call all of us to be accountants. Can I get an amen to that one? Right? All he wants us to do is to be accountable. He wants us to be able to give an account of what he's given to us. Most of us have had a time or two in our lives where the last thing that we wanted to do was look at our bank account. The last thing we wanted to do was pull up that bank statement pull up that app on our phone, and look at our bank account. But that's living in fear, and that's not how God wants us to live. The first step, and one of the, the big steps for us in becoming good money managers is knowing where our money is going. Can I just give you a real quick recipe for disaster in your life and how to avoid it? Easy credit plus ignorance of your financial condition equals disaster. Easy credit 
plus ignorance of your financial decision, excuse me, your financial condition equals disaster. If you keep saying, I just don't know where it all goes, then you're violating this principle of being a good manager. Part of being a good manager is keeping accounts. And if you don't keep accounts, you'll constantly be in debt. And you'll constantly be living with the financial tension and financial pressures in your life. See, when we understand, we understand that everything is God's and we're just managers, then it becomes very clear that every financial decision we make is really a spiritual decision. And beyond that, every decision also, it becomes a powerful opportunity for us to show our trustworthiness, to show that we are trustworthy managers of the resources that God has given us. Our financial decisions, they can often be pretty interesting things, right? Our financial decisions, they tell what's really important to us. The things that we purchase, the ways that we choose to spend our money, and it's really not ours, the money that God has given to us, the way that we choose to spend it shows our values. How we manage our resources speaks volumes about whether we have really put our trust in God or the things of security that lead to false happiness. So we know that everything belongs to God. We know that, that we're supposed to be good managers and this brings us to the last piece for us, having more space between our ears, financial space in our minds and in our lives. And the encouraging part about it is there's freedom that comes from being a good manager because God will reward good managers. God will reward good managers. When you read this parable, the parable of these talents, the parable of these servants, it says you've, you've done such a great job with the little bit I've given you, I'm going to give you more. When you're a good manager, you receive more. We were trusted with more. And can I tell you, it's pretty amazing when God trusts you with more. When he sees you as trustworthy enough to, to give more of his resources, this idea comes up a lot that those who have done well will be blessed with additional resources. When God sees that we have faith in him, that we can trust him, that he can trust us to be good managers with his gifts, he knows that we can handle greater responsibilities. Now, it means that he's not going to dig us more responsibilities than we can handle with it because he knows our strengths, he knows our weaknesses, so he's going to give us what we're able to deal with as far as our, our finances go. But as we get to, to being better stewards of our finances, it helps us find breathing room in our money. It helps us find space around our money. Even if we don't suddenly have more, man, more money right in that moment, when, when we aren't afraid of facing our finances, it takes up a lot less mental space between our ears. That space that's created to be an opportunity for all the other areas of our lives to begin to flourish. Most of us have wished at some point in our lives that we had more time, more energy, or more finances to do more for God. And when we start by getting our finances in order, it can make space in all the other areas of our life to begin to grow. We all need to deal with the space between our ears if we're going to have any financial space, if we're going to have any financial breathing room in our lives and in our minds. Once we deal with that space between our ears, then thankfulness, gratitude, and praise in various forms begin to seep in and creep into our lives in ways that we don't expect it. And you'll start to see God as your provider for everything. You start to appreciate him more. You realize that, that he, that it's all his and he gives you a big part of it. See, he asks you to give, but he also asks you to keep some too. You'll find yourself thankful for what you get to keep and what you get to give. Your finances, they'll no longer be a stress. Instead, they'll continually point you back to your loving Heavenly Father 
who loves, loves to do good things, who loves to reward his kids. And you want to celebrate, and you want to join in with the Father's party. You guys, this message is not about financial management. This message is about life management. The Bible says there are eternal implications with how we manage our money. God uses money, he set up money, as a test for us. Money is a test for how responsible we are as a person. Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 11, he says, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? The Bible clearly teaches that your rewards and your responsibilities in heaven will be determined by how good of a manager you were with your resources that God has given you here on this earth. And for some, it's time to change and create some space because you're not doing a very good job. And for others, it's time to repent because we've been trying to do it by ourselves. We think that we're the reason our income is what it is. Everything that we have belongs to God. One day I'm going to stand before God and give an account of how I use my money. And you will too. This is a test. Whether you have a lot or a little. You remember back to that parable. There was the servant who had five talents. There was the servant who had two. And there was the servant who had one. It didn't matter how much they got. It mattered how faithful they were with what they had. It didn't matter how much they got. It mattered how faithful they were with what they had. Whether you make six figures or four figures, how faithful are you with what God has given you? Are we being faithful with what we're given and creating space to live our lives the way that God wants us to live? Would you pray with me?